<laughs> Were you recording that? I just got hit in the head with my fucking bottle cap <laughs> opening my beer. Oh, good times. Hey, when people get hurt on the show, it makes for good radio, right? Thanks for hanging out with me again on Misery Point Radio. Always stoked to be here. Always stoked to have you back with me in the Matrix, hanging on for dear life on another crazy trip through the wasteland of internet radio. I should warn you, though, it's probably a good idea to get your blood checked for metal poisoning because I'm about to infect you all with another dose of toxic metal awesomeness. Not sorry. So, as you're all probably aware by now, because you're all cyber stalkers and you're watching everything that I do, I know it. Well, I went to see False Prophet of Possessed a few months back in Oakland, California. And while I was there, way before showtime, super early, dicking around the stage and being an otherwise nosy motherfucker, I ran into today's guest. We were just kind of hanging out, talking to some of the same people. And he comes up to me and he's like, hey, my name's George. And we just kind of shot the shit for a few, had an awesome conversation, talked about the upcoming show, and then after that, we kind of parted ways. Hey, you know, not long after that, I downloaded his album, and I was like, wow, this is really fucking cool. I'd love to have this guy on. So, I emailed him, he emailed back, long story short, he agreed to come on the show, and here we are today. So, I am really excited to bring you something just a little different, because today's guest is a true master of the macabre, somebody who strives to bring real, in-depth, dark storytelling back into the world of metal and give us a taste of what we've all been missing. So please welcome to Misery Point Radio from blackened horror metal band From Hell, George Anderson, otherwise known as Alistair Sin. George, welcome to the show, brother. What's happening? How are you? I am awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it's been a while that we've been talking about doing this, and I'm glad we uh, finally get a chance to talk uh, almost face-to-face. You're over there in Oakland right now, and I'm here in Seattle, but the uh, power of technology, the magic, if you will, is, uh, allows us to make this happen. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, so um, before I forget, I wanted to mention a couple of things before we dig into stuff, but... Uh, so I, I bought a copy of uh, your album, Ascent from Hell, and I was really stoked when I got like a personal message back from you, and I thought it was something different, because I buy a lot of albums online, you know, Bandcamp and whatever other formats are out there, and uh, so I got this thing back, I was like, huh, this sounds almost like a real person sending this back to me, So the, <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, hey, you know, maybe it's just one of those cool, like, on-the-ball form letter kind of things, and then... Uh, so I responded back, and then you responded back again, and that's when I realized, oh, hey, this is actually you. So I thought in the world <laughs> of, of today's music, um, that definitely set things apart for me, that you're actually that in touch with uh, your bass, that, that you send out a personal thank you. I, I just thought that was epic. Is that something that you do all the time? I try to as often as I can. Um, if somebody you know, messages me, you know, I, I always try to respond, you know. Yeah. I always try to say say hey to people, you know, if they you know, if they take the time to send me a message then yeah, I'm gonna say hi back. <laughs> yeah, no, I, you know, I, why, I why wouldn't I? Yeah, I think that's awesome. And it definitely lends uh an air of, of credibility and an air of, of of a personal touch to something that I think a lot of people think that musicians and artists are kind of out there in the world somewhere and they're not necessarily people that you can approach and talk to. So I just uh, I think that's really cool. So uh props to you for doing that. Thanks. I, I, you know, I, I, I try to do my best, you know, um, I do have somebody else who does handle some of the social media posting stuff sure. for me because I, you know, there's a lot of technology out there and a lot of, you know, different social media platforms and I, I just can't keep up with all that. So I certainly have someone help me, but as best as I can, I try to reply. And if somebody, you know, specifically talks to me, then definitely I'll respond and say, Hey, what's going on? And yeah, I, I try to engage with people when I can. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I also wanted to uh, touch on something real quick. And so you and I met uh, briefly in Oakland at the False Prophet Possessed show. And I yes. sat down with uh, Claudius and, of course, Paul Ray. And, uh, you know, you and I were both there pretty early. And then I realized kind of after the fact why you were there so early. And, and all <laughs> of that gear was stamped from hell. Um, so was this like uh, Alistair Sin's band rental delivery service that you were hooking these guys up with? What's going on over there? <laughs> no, nah, well, we toured with uh, Possessed. So they're, they're friends of, of mine. And Claudius actually used to play in From Hell right. uh, a few years ago. So um, after we released the record... Um, you know, Steve was busy, uh, with one machine and he lived in London at the time. So, you know, I needed, uh, someone to fill in and, you know, I had my buddy Shiloh Kramer fill in for a little while. We did a few shows, did some runs up North and then, you know, yeah, you know, he lived way far South. And so, you know, I needed somebody who was just shredding and, you know, Clytus was a friend of mine. I'd known him for a long time and, and, uh, he had also, Interestingly enough, replaced Steve in the Dragon Lord. In Dragon Lord, yeah, which uh, everybody now knows. I have a huge thing for Dragon Lord, so uh... Uh, yeah, I, I loved that first record, and so I'm like, well, shit. If Claudius can play Steve's leads, then you know he would be a great fit for this. So yeah, um, you know, I hit him up, and and uh, you know we got started on it, and this was actually the first time Claudius picked up a seven string guitar. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and. You know, learned our material on that, and it wasn't something he'd ever been playing, but the guy just, just fucking kicked ass all over. I was just like, you know, so it was amazing having him in the band. And, you know, we did some stuff, and and then um, uh, he was telling me during the summertime that he had another band that was hitting me up, and he wouldn't tell me who it was. Right. And I said, hey, and I was like, yeah, man, you know, go for it, you know. You know, do what you need to do, you know. And then he told me later on that it was Possessed. I was like, wow. And the last show that Claudius played with us was with uh, Hellstar at the Uptown in Oakland. And um, let's see. And then right after that, uh, we landed a tour with Possessed uh, in Europe, with the East Over Europe tour. Yeah. Uh, 2016. And I'm, I, you know, I'm, you know, a thousand percent, you know, sure that Claudius had a hand in helping us get that. So, yeah. you know, we were stoked. That was a, that was a, a great tour. Yeah. And, you know. Everybody in Possessed is just awesome. So so when they were playing the show in Oakland, uh, they had some kind of miscommunication with their gear. And they were flying in, and they had no gear. <laughs> <laughs> and I get a phone call and a text I'm like from Claudius and from Bobby, and they're like, hey, we need some gear. I'm like, sure, yeah, no problem. You know, just let me know. And I you know, showed up a few hours later, had my gear out for them. Not a big deal. It was cool. I'm yeah. glad to help. You just unloaded all that shit yourself. You live down there, right by the club? It seems like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a that's a really cool area, by the way. I, that was my first time in Oakland, and uh, I noticed that that's a pretty happening spot. Just that whole area down there oh, yeah. seems pretty alive. There's a lot of uh, street musicians and artists kind of walking around down there, and uh, you know, it, it seems like it really supports kind of that stuff. But I I've been watching a lot of bills, a lot of metal bills come through in that particular spot. The, the Metro, the Oakland Metro seems like a really cool place for bands to come. There's through, actually so. a show going on there right now. <laughs> <laughs> My friends and uh, Larva are playing there and uh, there's a couple other bands that, so I may uh, hit up that show right after, right after our interview here. So yeah, there's a show going on there. I think there's another show going on at Eli's. So yeah, Oakland is just pretty busy. I mean, there's, there's a lot of good metal shows here all the time. We have another place called the Elbow Room uh, that used to be in Jack uh, in uh, San Francisco, um, but uh, the building owner sold that, and then the owner of the Elbow Room opened up uh, Elbow Room Jack London here in Oakland. So, so we have another kick-ass metal metal venue over here now. Yeah, well. Yeah. Um... I know that uh, we're going to spend some time talking about uh, Rats and Ravens a little bit here later on in the show, but uh, I did want to get a little bit of a quick history uh, from you. And, you know, we were just yep. briefly talking a little bit about uh, the fact that, you know, Claudia's played with you, but you've had uh, some pretty epic people come through your lineup as well. And uh, I know yes. some, some of those guys are still with you and some aren't. Just uh, But uh, who's playing with you right now? Right now I have uh, Wesley Anderson on drums. Okay. I have Stephen Paul Goodman on bass, and uh, he's uh, he used to be in Vicious Rumors, and then I have Steve Smythe uh, playing uh, lead guitar for me. Yeah, Steve. So still... Steve moved back here from uh, London, 
Oh. And so, you know, so um, <clears throat> so he's, uh, you know, he's pretty. He's a pretty busy guitar player. Sure. You know, he's in demand, but, you know, he's down to, you know, uh, being uh, from hell, and he's, you know, contributing a lot to the album, and, and you know, and it's just, it's coming along great. So, mm-hmm. yeah, Steve came back, and... And you uh, had yeah. a history a little bit with him uh, um, from your prior band. He he played uh, with you a little bit off and on, did some guest solo work, stuff like that. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird. Steve is the only other person who's been on all of my records except for me. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> and awesome. Steve is Steve is only really just kind of joined the band here recently, but you know he's been my friend for many years and. Um, he came in and did some guest leads on, uh, I had another band many years ago called Down Factor Mm -hmm. and he came in and he did a bunch of guest leads on the first record. And then, uh, when we recorded the second record a few years later, we thought it would be cool to ask him to do a guest solo on that. So he has one small lead on that one. Um, but he's still on it, you know, (laughs) (laughs) you know, and then that band dissolved in 2006. Right. Um, and then I started up from hell and then that went through a lot of different changes. And then, you know, finally I just kind of got fed up with, you know, you know, some of the local musicians and just not having, you know, all of our ducks, you know, you know, going in the you know same direction. So, you know, I, I, when I recorded the, recorded the record the first time, you know, I, I hit up some good people to help me record it. So, I had Steve help me record the, you know, he came in and did a bunch of the leads on Ascent from Hell. Right. Then I had a, another really good friend of mine who I've known for a long time, Damien Sisson, who plays bass for Death for Angel. For Death Angel, yeah. Yeah, so he came in and did a bunch of great bass work, you know. And then uh, another friend of mine, Paul Bostaff, who plays for Slayer. Small band called Slayer. Yeah. <laughs> he came in and <laughs> hooked me up on, on the drums. Yeah. And, you know, it was just, it was great. And so from from the down factor uh, when that band dissolved um the the concept of from hell was that already in your brain before you guys ended that last project or was it something where you just said I'm done with what I have to say with this band um and now I just want to go something else entirely and then you started from scratch after that band was already done that right there I thought you know down factor was very political and social you know it was my soapbox it was where i got up and was bitching about politics and religion and then all that shit and you know and uh, when that band kind of came to an end a it was really really fast some of that stuff was just super fucking fast and i mean not like i wouldn't say it's fast like origin but it was still up there i think you know some of our songs are at about 220 i think one of them was at 230 you know, which is plenty goddamn fast. Yeah, it was pretty and, quick. You know, I so I wanted to actually kind of slow things down quite a bit and kind of take a different turn. I, I didn't want to, you know, you know, I, I don't know. It was just some of that stuff was just over the top. I thought, and you know, I, I it just seemed like it wasn't fun anymore. And like that, that, maybe that was the people in the band too. You know, they kind of, yeah. you know, sometimes other people who are, you know. Sometimes they could just take the fun out of it. Not you sure. Know, but, did you did know. they did they have any inkling that maybe you were growing less satisfied with the material and that you wanted to do something else or? No, I I, I don't really know. I, I I don't really know. It just kind of came to an end and. And how long was it from the time that you uh, that project was done till the official formation of what became From Hell? Well, I started from hell probably in 2007. Uh, that's when I started writing. Actually, I started writing the material really in 2006. And, and then it took quite a while to get off the ground. You know, it took a couple of years. I found another drummer. Um, and we kind of worked on the material for about a year and a half and then kind of found some members. And then life happens, you know, fall out with that drummer and then he comes back a little while later and we pick it up again. And so, you know, a few years go by. And so we actually don't get around to our first show until uh, we, we, I think we did our first recording in like 2009 and then, but we didn't put it out till 2010. Okay. 
So like demo um, recordings or recordings that actually yeah, became Yeah, demo. Yeah, I had a couple of demo recordings of The Walking Dead and Soul Crusher. Um and then and then I started recording a new record, had a new group of guys and then that fell apart too and that was at that point I'm like, fuck this. <laughs> 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 I heard a similar story from a uh, from Paul Ray and False Prophet, who has gone through numerous lineup changes, and that seems to uh, set things back pretty far every time that happens. So I, the frustration I used to play in bands too, and that was always a frustrating part when you when you'd lose somebody, especially when you think you're at a spot where hey, this is actually getting going. You know, this is uh, right, starting right, to yeah. gain some traction. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the, what's nice is the guys I play with now, you know, they play in other bands too. And, you know, I'm sure. like, cool, whatever, you know, you know, that way everybody still gets to, you know, play other styles of music, whatever. I, you know, I, I never want to be one of those, one of those hard ass guys like, no, you can only be in my band, you know, yeah, yeah, all right. Like, I'd rather, you know, I have, you know, the guys I jam with are, you know, super pros and they just, you know, that's what they do is they play music. And, yeah. and I was, you know, uh, when the last, I'd actually already recorded a lot of material with another drummer. And then uh, there were some mistakes and I wanted to go back and fix them. And he refused. And I was like, he refused, he refused to fix some mistakes. He refused to go and fix some of the stuff. I'm like, "Ah, I'm done. Wow. Like, you know, and so that's when I called up Paul and, and Steve, you know, and when Paul, you know, Paul was on board, then I got Steve and Damien and, and, you know, and then we just, you know, finished up the recording, you know, and uh, they just came in and added their touch to it and just made it sound awesome. Yeah, and yeah, awesome it is. So, From Hell is, in its every sense, a concept band. And talking more so than just doing concept albums, you developed this as every album is going to be its own story. So I know that you were uh, very influenced or very much uh, a fan of King Diamond. How, how did you take your uh, love for, for that band and that music and, and King Diamond and, and kind of make this your own concept? That's a good question. Um, well, let's see. Um, I just, I wanted to try to do something just a little bit different. Yeah. Um, I, you know, after, like I said, after doing Down Factor that was all political, I, I wanted to step away from anything politics, anything religion. The one thing I really loved about the, about King Diamond Records is when I listen to one of those songs, I'm immediately in that story, right. in that realm of what he's, of, of, of the story he's telling. And I thought, you know, that's so much better than, than having, you know, a bunch of one-off songs where it's, I'm bitching about politics. I'm bitching about religion. It's like, well, you know, I've already di- I've already done that. And in fact, the first two, you know, the both of the Down Factor records, you know, the lyrics from the first album five years later still applied to everything that was going on politically. Sure. And then five years after that, they still applied. I'm like, well, how many goddamn times can I rehash this shit? <laughs> so. I'm like, I just, I don't want to sing about politics anymore because it doesn't change. Right. We all know religion's fucked up. Uh, you know, we all know people have social problems. Am I going to change anybody's mind? Is that what I'm trying to do? Am I just going to be on my soapbox and be pissed off and angry all the time? God, I really don't want to do that. I really want to play music and enjoy it. I love horror stuff. I love King Diamond. And I thought, you know, I want to make a band where I'm playing some heavy music but I'm telling a story and you know, when I'm playing music for other people, if I can pull them out of here, out of our political, out of our real world and put them in a little story, you know, where they can just listen to this story and be into this realm and forget about all this other crap. That's just the real hell around us and, you know, provide something, you know, that's still heavy. It's still metal. And, you know, still, you know, fun to listen to, um, but tells a story, you know, and it's just, it, it's, it's like kind of reading a book or listening to a book. It takes you out of what's going on here. And so it's very immersive, you know, with music being, you know, kind of with what I, what I want to do, I don't want to necessarily pollute it with political shit that's going on all the time. I already did that with Down Factor 
you know, there's other great bands out there like Lamb of God who get out there and they bitch about politics and people go, yeah, <laughs> great, great. All right. Well, you know, you're preaching to the choir. So I, I don't really want to bitch about politics. So yeah. I, I, I really, you know, am, am vested into this horror concept, you know, kind of thing. And so, um, you know, just trying to come up with a different sound altogether. Um, I started playing a seven string guitar. Um, and when we were doing Down Factor, we were doing C sharp, and which actually seemed kind of a weird space for my voice. So, so, um, tuning down to seven, you know, using a seven string, um, it seemed to fit a little bit better for me that way. So, um, um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's, yeah. And you, you it's played, right. you played in a, uh, was it grandma? You played in like a tribute or oh, kind of like a, yeah. an inspired by a band? A King, a King Diamond tribute band. Grandma. Yeah. yeah. Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Hey, you know, no pressure, but if that, if that was to uh, hit the market, um, you know, you'd have at least one buyer. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, Wes actually used to play drums in that band too. Oh, me, crazy. So yeah everything so. comes full circle so mm-hmm. you know you were touching a little bit about uh kind of where you went in, in making it different you you were going for kind of a heavier sound but with the same kind of themes of horror movies and and uh your sound definitely has a very unique it's hard to define it into one genre which i think is awesome because that's that's what makes it unique right so it's it's got this thrash element to it it's got this power metal element to it it's got this death metal element to it and every song is different and not only is every song different in the case of ascent from hell every song is done by different characters which you also play yeah kind of sort of Mm -hmm. yeah so you've got a whole lot going on there for sure so um which came first the the concept for from hell or the concept for Alistair Sin? From Hell came first. Yeah. and From Hell came first. When you sat around and you thought about how you wanted that to be, uh, when did... Well, the... I, I, I guess it was, it was kind of simultaneous, you okay. know, because when I was developing From Hell and I wanted to do this horror story thing, and so Alistair Sin came about because I wanted to essentially be King Diamond without being King Diamond. I, you know, I didn't want to, you know, follow a lot of the other, you know, kind of black metal bands, you know, with the corpse paint, because, you know, how is that going to stand out from a lot of anything else that's going on? And, sure. You know, so, so, you know, I mean, you know, clearly my skin's a little darker. And then I, so I developed this, this, this costume that, you know, with the long white hair and my beard is white. You know, I, I also thought about, I'm like, well, you know, a lot of bands that, you know, have been playing for a long time, the hair starts to turn white, and they fight really hard to make it turn black again. <laughs> like, you know what? <laughs> Screw it. I'm just, I'm just going to roll with it. My beard's white. Right. I'm going to go with this crazy white hair kind of thing. It's, uh, you know, instead of putting on corpse paint, I'll have this crazy white hair and these white contacts that, and this black robe that I wear. And so essentially this is my version of King Diamond without being King Diamond. Right. So Alice Sin is a storyteller. He's up there on stage telling these horror stories live. So he is a storyteller, yet at the same time, he's also... It's weird also... to talk about having a third person like that. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? You're talking about yourself. Hey, I should say hi to both of you, right? Um, he... Hi, hi. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he's the storyteller, but he's also a character, kind of a lord of the dead, if you will. So when you're up there playing, um, when you're singing as Alistair Sin, how do you get into that mindset of, I also have to be the storyteller? I, you know, I just, you know, when I when I put the black robe on, and put the contacts on, put the hair on, I'm in it. You know, yeah. when we're getting ready to go on stage, it's it's not hard for me to to get into that character mode. I just I kind of feel it, you know, and it, it works for me. So the story of Ascent from Hell is is, uh, you know, basically 
corpse uh, finds out he's dead and uh, realizes that uh, he's got to go back to the land of living, grab his soul back from a priest who's still alive, and drag his ass back to hell, correct? Yeah, pretty close. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, Alistair Stan is a character in that story. I, I'm not sure Alistair Stan is going to be a character in the next story, uh, but will certainly be the storyteller live. You know? Right. Um, so the first story, the first album is about a corpse who wakes up in hell, finds out his corpse, or his soul is still alive on earth in another body. And he's been told by the God of hell that he has to return to earth to find his soul and bring it back to hell. So the corpse is uh, the corpse and soul of a psycho killer. Right. Who was knocked off by a vigilante nun yeah the <laughs> nun with the, the gun that part of the story actually gets fun yeah um but yeah so there's a song called nun with a gun and so the the psycho killer is just being a psycho killer and uh the vigilante nun is hunting him down she takes him out and at the moment that death comes to collect the soul of the priest um the psycho killer his soul sees his opportunity and jumps back into the body of the priest as the nun is resuscitating him. So he comes back to life, but now he's, but now he's a psycho killer. And so then the psycho killer priest goes back to his congregation, and gives everybody the Kool-Aid, <laughs> knocks them all off. <laughs> That's awesome. Very, uh, very Jim Jones. So, uh... right. Right. And, and so at some point, uh, the psycho killer the priest starts having dreams and this feeling that something's not right. Of course, you know, something's not right. He's not in yeah, his own body. Yeah, and he's fucking dead. And then dead. <laughs> he starts having these, these dreams that his corpse is trying to kill him. And so, you know, there's a line in the very first song, The Walking Dead, you know, where it says, strangely, the one killing me is me. Right. And so these are the, the dreams that he's having. And then in a scent from hell, uh, he opens the door and his corpse is his corpse is standing there waiting for him, and all these other hordes of zombies are behind him to drag him back to hell. Yeah, man, that's crazy. So, when you were developing the concept for this, did you write the songs in what would become chronological order, or did they all kind of get born of their own concept and then you put them together after the fact? Oh man, you know the the development of this is it's such a weird and hard process. You right. know, it's it's a lot of what is the story going to be? Um, and actually, when I wrote that story, like I had the story is actually kind of old, and actually, and the sleep is sort of like when I wrote the sleep the first time many years ago. The sleep is kind of. The Sent from Hell story in one long nine-minute song. But then I just decided that, well, you know what? Uh, I'm going to record this song and put it on the internet anyway. Even though the sleep technically doesn't need to be at the end of the story, the story really does end at the end of A Sent from Hell. But then I decided to add the prologue of the sleep on there. Hell, I had Paul Bush stop playing drums on him. I'm like, well... Shit, who else am I going to have record this song? You know, might as well have Paul do it. He's here. <laughs> awesome. So um, so I actually had a beginning and an end, and it took me a little while to meet somewhere in the middle to tie it all together. And I, man, that was, that was, that was really difficult. That was, had to climb some, you know, mind walls and, you know, a lot of obstruction trying to figure out, like, how do I do this? How do I make this work? And, when I came up with the idea of, ah, the psycho killer can leap his soul into the corpse of the psycho killer and come back, that was my tie from the beginning to the end. Did you do, like, outlines and have all kinds of shit mapped oh, out? Yeah. And, yeah. Oh, man. oh, God. I Yeah. Scripts upon scripts and, you know, oh, yeah, all kinds of stuff. Who did, you, <laughs> who did you bounce your ideas off, if anybody, or everybody? Or did you just keep that all to yourself and go crazy? I think this one I more kind of kept to myself, I guess. I mean, I would tell my friends a little bit, but it it, it wasn't really a story. I could just, oh, hey, I got the story. Let me tell you about it. <laughs> right. It didn't really come off like that, you know. So I, you know, I really just, you know, had to write it all on my own, you know. And uh, so 
When did you know all the songs? When did you know the story was done? Okay. Um, uh, the story was, well, the, the, the tie came together in a song called Eyes of My Dead. Okay. Um, but the album was finished actually when I wrote None With A Gun. None With A Gun was actually the last song. Okay. Uh, and then, um, uh, but yeah, I kind of had the tie when I, when I, when I wrote Eyes of My Dead. And I, I'd already written the song, but you know, when I kind of put the lyrics together for that one. And actually, I had a lot of fun writing the lyrics to that one just because it had a very theatrical element to it, just in the way that whole song is put together. Right. Um, and that actually happened to be Paul's favorite song, too. Yeah. So, you know, he really, he, he yeah, he, he liked that one a lot, too. Yeah, the, uh, speaking of theatrical, I, I do like how you, you put in the little uh, uh, outtakes, uh, the little kind of movie clips, if you will, in the album, which right. was kind of cool to help kind of tie things together. I thought that was cool. Yeah, I, I, I call them soundscapes. I didn't know what else to call them. Soundscape or radio play. Where did you record those at? In studio or did you go on location for any of those? Or? Oh, we did that in the studio. Oh, yeah, no, that was super that. awesome. The whole album was done after the album was done and mixed um i worked with another engineer named winter and i told him what i wanted i used to be a video editor for a little while and oh. so i was kind of working with some foley and stuff like that and and uh, i had, was starting to dabble into going into you know video production and movie production and so i had all these sound files you know all these you know um you know different different sounds for you know that they use in movies and whatever to to fill out the you know the sounds that don't get recorded on set and so i thought you know i'm going to use these to kind of create this kind of radio play type of element you know and some of that was also designed to tie the songs together because sometimes like i'll write the lyrics to a song and then i'll write the lyrics to the next song and i have this story in my head right but how i got this song to this song doesn't necessarily make sense to someone who's listening to it because they have no idea what the story is Sure. It's in my head. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, the the radio player, the soundscape is designed to lead people to the next part of the song. Like, oh, okay, this is what's happening in the story. Because otherwise, you know, sometimes, you know, the next song will be just another character. It'll be another chapter in the story. But people don't necessarily know how they got, from, you know, here to here. Yeah. Or to here. So, you know. Yeah, it's funny how something in your head that you think is clear, like an idea, people sometimes they don't, uh, they don't, it doesn't translate well, <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> but I can no, tell no. you this though. So, uh, every time you listen to a scent, you get something else out of it, right? One more piece of the puzzle cool. kind of falls into place. And I think cool. that's what I like about, uh, about that album. And a lot of, you know, story based concept albums. Like I'm a huge fan of Queensryche operation. Mind crime for me was my concept album that, that really, yeah. that kind of got, you know, I was playing, learning to play guitar when that album came out. And so that was hugely influential on me. But to this day, I still listen to that album and I still get one more little piece of the story, you know? And so, yeah, you know, so there's little radio plays on that concept album l more so than what King Diamond does. Yeah. And so I tried to, you know, I definitely tried to use some of that idea in with what I was doing. I'm like, okay. You know, I'm going to use the idea that King Diamond has. And he oftentimes will have a beginning. Right. And maybe some creepy one-off song in the middle. It's like a minute and a half, two minutes long of him just going off the rails. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I love that shit. You know, those, yeah. are, those are oftentimes my favorite songs on, on each of the albums. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I definitely use that element that, that, that Queen's Reich had. You know, a little, little bit of story play, some more you know, sound effects. And I thought, you know, well, the sound effects will help put people in that realm, in that atmosphere. It's like, it'll help kind of tell the story of where we're at now. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So like, there's a moment between a song called, uh, psycho, was it, uh, between soul crusher and psycho killer where there's just a big change in, in the soundscape in between. It's, you know, really to identify that the whole scenery has changed. Like, right. You've, You've now been transported from being down in hell, and now you're on Earth here, and there's a new scene going on. Yeah, no, it works really well, and uh, I, I do like, I like the small reveals. I think that uh, kind of always keep you guessing, and 
you know, a story is no fun if you get the whole story up front and then you're just waiting for shit to happen. I like it better when you're immersed and you're like, oh my God, what the fuck's going to happen next, you know? And the titles of the songs are really cool too, so... Um, I, I think, uh, but you know, none with a gun. That's that <laughs> probably one of the awesomest song titles out there. Not going to lie. Pretty awesome. So yeah, people love that song. I didn't really, you know, I didn't really think too much about it, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that one, I, certainly all of the songs are very dark, but then when you get to none with the gun, it's a little more upbeat. It's kind of fun to sing. It's got almost you know. a like a action comic book vibe, you know, like I'm gonna come out right. here and fuck you up kind of a vibe. So <laughs> right, that's, right, yeah, it's pretty and, awesome. Yeah, when we were in Europe and and actually we were in Russia too. Yeah, people just loved that song. Like none with a gun. Yeah. That was your favorite song. <laughs> well, and you got <laughs> to they, they identified with that one like much faster than a lot of the other songs. Sure. You know? yeah. yeah, it was cool. And speaking of theatrical, I was watching some videos. Um, I noticed that you had actually at some of the shows, probably the local ones, I would assume, uh, I believe one at the Metro in particular, you had the crazy blood-covered zombie chick dancers. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> he says, oh, yeah. So I assume they couldn't follow you to Russia. Um, but no, uh, <laughs> a, little, a little tough to do that. And, you know, no space in, you know, uh, when we're traveling in Europe either. You know, just besides, you know, you said is, Usually half an hour, you know, when you're one of the early bands, because you know we're you know on a bigger bill, so right, it's not necessarily feasible to bring all that and try to set all that up. You know, when we were in Europe, you know, we had, you know, we had a, a ten minute, fifteen minute set change. You know, we're not, you know, we can't bring lights out and set all this shit up and do all that. You know, that that'll be another time when, yeah, you know, hopefully we'll have a little bit of, you know you know, have a bigger draw and a, you know, longer time set that we can actually do that sort of thing. Right. And hopefully, you know, what we might do actually is uh, actually put something together and then just find people on the road. And it's like, yeah, show up before the show. Maybe, you know, we might make it simple enough that they can show up, you know, half an hour or an hour before the show or oh, maybe earlier than that and kind of learn, learn the routine or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, put out a little know, casting had, call or something. Yeah, something like that, you know. We'll see. Yeah, <laughs> we'll but, see. Uh, you know, I mean, I, you know, when I put ads up for it, I always get a slew of calls. It's, you know, girls love this gig. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Yeah, we have a great time. Cool. Yeah, it's cool. So, five long years since Ascent from Hell came out, and mm -hmm. um, so now we're getting into the time of new material in the works. Uh, been watching your yep. studio diaries, been uh, checking out the cool stuff you got. So uh, the story of Alistair Sin isn't finished, or at least the storytelling of Alistair Sin isn't finished. He's coming back to tell a new story, Rats and Ravens. Tell me about that. I'm not really sure how much of the story I can reveal at this point. You know, just uh, we're in the middle of recording right now. Um, we have a little more than half of it finished. Uh, we have a couple uh, tracks to finish up on bass, and then the vocals. Um, I, I'm not really sure what I can say about the story yet. I mean, I don't want to be sure. I don't want to be too cryptic, but at the same time, it's not going to come out until February 2019. So, you got a little ways to go. You know, right? You know, so you know, other, otherwise, you know, we would be, you know, we put a couple of the songs out. I, I guess what, what can I say about Rats and Ravens? What the story is about? Something in the woods lures them from their beds. They disappear in the night and presume to be dead. But when the moon is full, they all come back home. Not just back home, but back from the dead. Awesome. So we're going to continue with Alistair uh, painting the backdrop of this story. But it's a whole new story, a whole new setting, a whole new set of characters, mm -hmm. no tie-in to yep. Ascent, completely different. A new yep. season of the show, if you will. Absolutely. <laughs> so I uh, read something on one of your posts. I, I can't remember if it was on your uh, Facebook page or whatnot, but you had... Um, you had mentioned that the process for this for recording this album with what you guys are doing is different. Um, you've got a different studio you're working out of. 
Uh, the sound is uh, sounding to be a little bit different from what I understand. Um, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, it sounds a lot different. What's What's different about about this album? Um, I think just maturing and and writing. You know, like you know, writing the new songs. Uh, they just they're coming out a little bit different. I also have you know different players in the band who are going to have a slightly different influence on the tone. And I, you know, I just, I love the people I'm jamming with right now. They're, they're just awesome. And they just, they have a great feel for what they're doing. And so, and so just the way they play the songs and the way, just the way we sound together. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I would say it's just the way we sound together. Um, the first album you wrote predominantly most of it by yourself, correct? the the main yes. the main stuff is this one seeming to be more collaborative uh as you've had some people with you um i've written i've written all the songs myself okay um and i'll bring in the songs to the band like i'll i'll put demo tracks together you know i'll use like drum kit from hell and just kind of make up some basic parts you know so you know the song goes and you know kind of like this and then i'll bring it to the band and they'll listen to it, and then we'll start playing it, and we'll go through it, and we'll figure out what works and what doesn't. And it, not, you know, ninety percent of the time, it doesn't come out, you know, like the demo sounds at all. <laughs> right. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it comes pretty close. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, it's just going to sound a little bit different, you know. And it really has to do with the feel of the players, and you know, the feel of how West plays the drums, and the feel of how Steven plays the bass, you know, and, 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 you know, the, the melodies that Steve puts on top, you know, so it's, it, and, you know, actually, you know, writing the lyrics is, um, I had a lot of the lyrics written already for the last album, you know, um, but I've had to wait, you know, for us to, you know, largely record a lot of the songs before I can figure out how the lyrics are going to go. Right. Because I need to hear how the music's going to sound. Because it's not going to sound the way I made the demos. Sure. Not at all. You know, uh, so. It, you're, it better, you know, though, you're saying. It's it's coming out better than what you'd have thought. Oh, yeah. I would assume. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, no question. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember seeing this uh, really cool interview that you guys did, or or, or at least it was uh, uh, you, Damien, and Paul. And uh, Paul mentioned that it was very rare that you guys were ever in the same room when you were recording. Oh, yeah. um, Rarely. Is that... Uh, continuing the trend with this album or are you guys going to, uh, you mentioned that Steve was back in the area now. So yes. is there going to be more of a, having you guys all together at the studio kind of a thing? Yeah. You know, when we started recording this, we were all, all together when we tracked the drums. So we actually, you know, the, the drums were pretty live, you know, like everybody was in the room when we tracked the drums and then, you know, we record the drums and then, uh, you come back later and you, record the guitars and then you add the bass and you, you know, do the vocals. But, um, we were all together when we recorded the drums for sure. So everybody was, you know, everybody was part of the initial recording process. And then as you get further down, you know, everybody focuses on their parts. And, you know, when Steven is in there doing his bass lines, nobody else needs to be there. You know, right. People have to work and, you know, do their own thing. And, you know, we'll be in the studio for, you know, hours and hours. So, you know, I, don't expect other people to sit there, you know, while Steven's playing bass and, you know, there isn't anything for anybody else to do other than sit there. So, yeah, they don't, they don't really need to be there, you know, and then they'll come back and, you know, once we, you know, record a bunch of stuff and have some rough mixes, then we, you know, send it out to everybody and everybody listens to it and, you know, gets back to me on what they think and what we need to fix or change or whatever, you know, or redo, you know, stuff like that. So you're at Earhammer Studios now. Yes. And uh, why yep. the change of venue? Well, it's more about, um, um, I guess, uh, finding an engineer who is you know, really into, you know, kind of a darker style. You know, and it's entirely possible that maybe, you know, this album sounds the way it does because we're working with Greg. Yeah. We're working with Greg Wilkinson over there. And he records a lot of the, black metal and and uh hardcore bands in, in uh oakland and so you know i i run a giant rehearsal studio also here in oakland and so i see a lot of the bands and i thought you know 
Uh, when we came back from Russia, I was kind of looking around for another engineer to uh, record the album. And um, I thought about him, and we dropped in, and we, you know, we did those two songs. And my band just really liked working with Greg a whole lot. Super easy going guy, super mellow to work with, and so yeah, you know, it was just certainly he's been one of the better recording experiences all of us have had. Yeah. So you know, so he's a great guy to work with. Do you think that this album is uh, the process has been a lot more streamlined than uh, than say the first one? Um, uh, no, <laughs> it all, it, no, no, it all kind of works the same way, yeah. you know, you go in, you record, well, I mean, when I did the last album, I went in, you know, we recorded the drums, then we recorded the guitars, and then, you know, there were some mistakes, and we went back, but I had a lot of the guitars recorded, but we do everything to a click, so, you know, when we, you know, deleted the drums, and I had Paul come in, Paul just, you know, had to play what was already there, right, so I didn't have to go and change any of that. So Well that okay. makes it that makes it better. Uh, yeah. So uh now the process is the same. Cool. You know, go in and you know, you do your bass tracks and you clean everything up and you you know, make sure you get all the notes right and you know, making an album, you know. <laughs> it's one time, you know, it's not live. So Yeah. So uh is there a possible thinking out here uh possible documentary in the works as well you seem to be capturing a lot of uh pictures at the studio uh am i jumping the gun on you here <laughs> i don't know, I don't know. Yeah, maybe <laughs> i don't know got some got some i mean we'll record some footage if there's a documentary cool later on yeah. i don't know i'm i don't know if it happens cool i got other stuff to think about <laughs> yeah you got a lot on your plate right now what about shows coming up? I know you guys are uh, working on some new material. Have you put uh, live shows on hold for now while you finish the recording of this one? Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't, I don't. You know, what's happened in the past year and the year before that? You know, trying. To, I mean, some of this stuff's been around for you know a couple of years now, but you know, every time you know we try to work on the album, it's like you know, oh, there's a show coming up. So yeah. I try to not schedule shows so that we can write. And then I'm thinking that, oh, well, you know, if I book a show, you know, six months in advance, you know, then, you know, we should be ready by then. And inevitably life gets in the way. And then, oh, shit, we got a show coming up. Yeah. Oh, we can't work on the album. We got to prepare for the show. And then all of a sudden writing is on hold all over again for God knows how long till you're done with the show. So um, and, you know, we started writing uh i mean we were you know we were writing last year and we were supposed to spend you know all spring and summer writing and then i i thought oh well we should be pretty close to being finished by june or you know and so i booked a show in july uh yeah that was a mistake <laughs> i mean the show was fun don't get me wrong sure. we had a great time at the show but it certainly interrupted the writing process i was right. like ah oh. You know, so then once we got back from that, then we had to kind of regroup. And and then that's when I said, all right, you know, no more shows until, well, until, until you know, we're done. But then Carla LeVay hit me up for the Black X Mass show in December that we do every year. Right. And so, so uh, we had that show come down the pipeline. So, you know, we're going to play that one. Yeah, that, that one looks like a hoot, man. I was uh, seeing some pictures on that. That looked like it was a blast. That show is so much fun every year. We just have a, a great fucking time. Unfortunately, the Elbow Room has gone now, at least the one in San Francisco and the one in Jack London's quite a bit smaller, maybe a third of the size. Yeah. So it's like, oh, you know, I don't know how we're going to do our show there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe they'll do it at the Uptown or something this year. Or, I don't know. It's Carla's in San Francisco, so... She might just find another venue over there. I don't. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not sure we're going to do it this year. We'll see. Sure. She might ask. I don't know. But the focus now is Rats and Ravens. The recording, yes. getting that nailed, getting that dialed in. What What can we expect of Rats and Ravens when it comes out? It's definitely different. I thought the I thought a set from Hell was pretty dark. I think this one's a little bit darker. Um, there's a lot of moody kind of mellow, you know, 
dark uh, melodies in, on this album. You know, a lot of uh, interesting chord progressions, and uh, you know, it's just it's the writing process has kind of matured a little bit on this one, which I kind of, you know. I really like that a lot, you know, looking for different ways of like, how do I still play heavy music without playing stupid fucking bar chords? I mean, you need your bar chords, but at the same right. time, you know, you gotta, you gotta kind of, you know, make a sound palette. And so what's really nice about having Steve and Steven in the band is they're both just phenomenal with theory and melody. And so, um, you know, I can present them, present to them, hey, I want to do this. And uh, the nice thing about having two guitars is that we don't always do the same things together. So I'm playing one thing and then Steve is playing something else. Yeah, I and love that. Honestly, you just, you know, like without two guitars, these songs won't sound the same at all. Like you really need two guitars and, you know, you're going to need the bass on this too. You know, a lot of songs you just sit there and, you know, try to learn, you know, you know, when you're, you know, uh, I mean, just a lot of guitar players will play the same thing, you know, and then they'll do like, you know, the fifth harmony or something like that, or the octave, you know, you know, kind of Iron Maiden type of stuff. But I really <laughs> tried to use, you know, I love all that stuff. All that, that stuff's great. You know, you know, certainly we you know, do it on occasion too. Um, but having two guitars doing two different things, just, it, it just sounds uh really amazing to me so i'm i'm looking forward to that you know you know it should have this really kind of really dark overtone to it i don't think this is going to be very happy <laughs> not a very happy album not a christmas album <laughs> <laughs> no <Nope>, not this one <laughs> so uh we're thinking that uh ballparking it you're shooting for the first part of next year yeah, you know, by the time we finish recording and mixing and then, you know, you get set up with your label uh, and the marketing and the promotion, um, it's just, you know, that's not stuff that happens, you know, right away. And, you know, since we're, like I said, since we're still in the middle of it, it's we're at the end of April now, it just makes more sense to wait until about February. That's when I'm presuming it's going to come out. I mean, I think I think that's you know, a good window. Cause you know, can't release anything in October, certainly in, you know, November or December. It's just, it's chaos. Yeah. You know, with the holidays and yeah. whatnot. And so, you know, we'll just wait till February. It's not that big, big a deal. Awesome. So are you ready for some listener questions? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I took out all the ones that were like, uh, why is George so sexy? So sorry, they're not in here. So oh, man. damn it, man. <laughs> that one's from my mom. So, uh, <laughs> all right. This one's from, uh, from Jack Downey, uh, who sent me a message on the misery point page there. So, uh, thanks Jack. When you play live, how do you pull off all the different voices, especially when you do different voices in one song? Um, you know, they just, they're just in my head. They just come out that way, you know. Um, you know, in being influenced by King Diamond, you know, he has many different voices. And that's also part of the reason why I have the, the costume that I wear, too, is, like, right now, talking to you, uh, I'm George. Right. But when I get on stage and I put the costume on, then I don't necessarily feel like me anymore. Like, when I sing these songs, I don't, I don't feel like George, you know, like, like George doesn't sound like that. So, you know, I have these different voices that come out uh, for these characters. And I just, I just imagine what the character would sound like in my head. And then that's what comes out. Cool. So mm -hmm. I actually wondered that, that question myself. Um, and do you have to consciously know I'm going to switch to this character? Or does it just kind of happen naturally for you? You don't it have to think happens. about it. Uh, yeah, it just comes out. Awesome. Cool. Hey, uh, thanks for that, Jack. All right. We got one from, I think it's how Mark, how, or maybe it's Mark Howie. I'm not sure, but, uh, Mark, thank you. Uh, are you the only one in the band who plays a character? Do the other dudes have any roles besides just playing the straight musicians behind you? They're, they just, they're just musicians. <laughs> well, I wouldn't, you know, they're, they're, they're there to, you know, play the music for me. So, 
Um, but yeah, I'm the only one that, that dresses up as a character. Yeah. You know, it's I, I don't know. I guess I'm you know kind of modeled after King Diamond, but you know that you know that's just I'm the only one who sings, so it doesn't necessarily make sense for everybody else to dress up, you know, and you know so put Steve not, in a robe and be like, what's he doing up there? They're not necessarily playing any parts <laughs> of the songs. I know originally my I had another bass player named John Wayne Wrongly, and he really wanted to be. A character in the story. He really wanted to be the psycho killer in the story. <laughs> right. And yeah, he would have been perfect for that. Because he was yeah. a psycho killer? <laughs> He's kind of psycho. But I love him anyway, you know. <laughs> Always be my bro. But yeah, he, he definitely wanted to have more of an active role in the story kind of thing. But you know, it's you, you kind of can't have your band members play characters because they need to play the music. You know? So... Yeah, and you know, now that I think about it, there it's, really there really aren't like a whole lot of backup vocals happening or or anything. No, worse. not really. Yeah, no, not really. You know, so you know, most of the voices come out of me. Once in a while, you know, we might have some backups. You know, if we think of it that way. But um, at the moment, pretty much I handle it all. Yeah. Yeah. So the last one is from Alex Rogelio, which is how did you come up with the name from hell? He wants to know how you got that name in your head. Thanks, uh, Alex. Well, when I thought of when I thought of the concept story behind it, um, um, I was thinking of the graphic novel from Hell, which is actually about Jack the Ripper. <clears throat> oh, cool! And so I thought, well, you know, I, you know, I. I as you know, people have often asked me whether or not you know we would make like a comic book version of the story, and I'm like, no, I can't do that because there's a graphic novel called From Hell anyway, and I'd be infringing on their oh. trademark to do that, you know. So I like the idea of the name From Hell as being the band name, and we tell stories, but you know, I would never try to make a graphic novel or anything of our stories because that would wholly be infringing on what they do and it's you know um and it's kind of like a, a also a tales from the crypt kind of thing so it's like you know these are stories from hell right something <laughs> like that you know? so um and then and actually and and the other part of it was the original album was the album was originally going to be called the walking dead but for and reasons wrote, unknown <laughs> and i wrote the song the walking dead and we were, you know, I had already recorded the demo song for it. And then, you know, had, you know, problems with, you know, drummer or whatever. And so that kind of, you know, fell apart. And then, we, you know, re we regrouped. And then we started playing the song again. And then the TV show came out. I'm like, right. God damn it. <laughs> you know, and I, I had no idea that the, I had no idea that the TV show was even in the making, even in the works, when I wrote the song The Walking Dead, I had no idea. But The Walking Dead was also a graphic novel. Is it novel. also a graphic novel, exactly. <laughs> and so so there's the you know, the graphic novel for The Walking Dead and for From Hell. And I'm kinda like, well, you know, there's stories, you know, and so I think I'm just gonna use the name from hell. Kinda like you know, White Zombie has used the name from, you know, that old movie too. I'm like, well, you know, I'm just gonna use the name from hell. And this is, you know, we're going to tell stories from hell. Awesome. You know. Well, that pretty much sums that up. Uh, so thank you to uh, Jack, Mark, and Alex for uh, submitting those questions to us. Definitely appreciate that there. So, um, well, why don't you tell us where in the world can we find you? Plug all your social media sites, all your websites. Uh, let us know where we can track you down at. Oh gosh, let's see. Um, certainly, you can find us. the The website is the band website is from hell dot net. Uh, really simple. Uh, I mean, you can find us on Facebook. I think we are Facebook dot com. This band is from hell. Um, there's a lot of from hell stuff out there. It's you know sometimes yeah. the sometimes the soup is a little thick. <laughs> um, let's see. <laughs> it's creamy. Yeah, let's see. What else? Uh, we're on, you know, Twitter. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think if you just look up from Hell Band, it should pop up somewhere. Or if you look up uh, Alistair Sin, I think there's also a, a Twitter 
or uh, or Instagram. Yeah, there's definitely an Instagram for From Hell and Alistairson. Yeah, so, uh, um, and then there's stuff on uh, YouTube uh, under Scourge Records. If you go to Scourge Records, there's a bunch of uh, uh, From Hell videos there. Yeah, yeah, definitely check out the YouTube stuff. Uh, there are some really cool uh, videos out there, some live shows, some zombie chick action going on, cool light shows, cool sounds, cool phone shots right up on the stage. Uh, really, really, really good stuff you guys have put out there. So I'm really excited to hear what you guys got coming out for Rats and Ravens. Definitely going to be paying attention to all your posts there. And, of course, uh, anytime you want to come back on the show, my friend, you've got an open invitation. So you got some new stuff you want to plug? You know where to find me. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I'll hit you up here in a few months. We're recording. Um, I, I, we're going to do at least one, maybe two covers. I'm not sure. I, I, I can't tell you what they are yet, you know, but when we're, when we're finished, you know, we're definitely going to do one. I don't know about the second one, you know, if we have time and, you know, it works in the budget or whatever. Sure. Uh, we'll get to that one or if I can even sing it, you know, we'll see. Yeah. Well, <laughs> hey, you know, and maybe uh, maybe if we're lucky, uh, no pressure, but, you know, maybe get a single out here before the album releases, possibly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, we're going to uh, – well, th- I'm planning for the album to come out at least in February if things go my way. Um, and certainly before that, probably in – you know, in the time of chaos, you know, like Christmas time, we'll sure. start dropping some of the songs. Maybe even this fall, um, you know, we'll put out uh, one of the cover songs. Um, and then, you know, we're looking for some tours. So hopefully, um, uh, you know, we'll get set up on a tour out this fall before the record comes out. So awesome. So we'll see. Yeah, well, uh, be sure to keep me posted. And you guys make sure that you follow George, a.k.a. Alistair Sin, on all the social media stuff. Check out From Hell buy their merch, buy their albums. I promise you, you'll love them. And uh, George, thanks again for a chat with me here on the show today. Mike, thank you very much for having me on the show. I really, really appreciate it. Trust me, brother. The pleasure was all mine. So how about that? You got exclusive news about the upcoming making of Rats and Ravens. Possible news about a couple of cover songs coming our way possible news about some I don't know, maybe singles coming out before the release of the album. You got From the Man Himself, the origin of the band, the idea of the band, the formation of the band, everything you wanted to know about From Hell, you got right here today on Misery Point. So, as always, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe on all the platforms. iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, Spreaker, you name it. Go to the Facebook page, like it, share it, Check out the Instagram, check out the Twitter, and if you want to get personal, reach out, send me an email, miserypointradio at gmail.com. So, thanks for hanging out, and I'll talk to you again real soon on Misery Point Radio.